Okay, I'll, I'll start now. Okay, good morning, everybody in this classroom and in the other classroom and everybody watching remotely. Uh, welcome to this Helbus guest lecture series. We have a really great start. Uh, we have a very interesting guest lecturer, Mr. Sabri Subi from Melbourne, Australia. Sabri is the founder of King Kong, Australia's fastest growing digital marketing agency. Uh, Sabri has grown it from zero to $14 million in revenues in, in six years. And so far, King Kong has helped uh, in, to, gen to generate sales over $1 billion and, and uh, in, in 400 industries. So huge accomplishments. Uh, welcome, Sabri. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Uh, Hi. Uh, for those not in the classroom uh, with us, um, we do have an option uh, to put any questions you might have in the chat window. Um, and Penny, one of our staff members, is monitoring the chat. So if you have something you'd like to, to ask or, or comment on as we go through, please do put it in the chat. Um, and then Penny can, can monitor what's going on in that room if necessary. Thank you, George. So Sabri, uh, can you tell a little bit with your own words, where are you now as a person and as an agency like What's, what's going on now and, and how does the future look, look out? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, we've, we've been going for six years. As you said, I, I started this business six years ago in my bedroom with no more than $50 and an old computer that my girlfriend had bought me at the time. Um, and I was making 150 cold calls to, to businesses every single day to get my first few clients on board. And I did that. For, for a while working out of my bedroom for about seven to, to, to nine months or so. And then I got my first office and then hired my, my first team member. And it's been a wild ride, um, you know, going from zero employees to the point right now where we've got 70 employees. Um, you know, we've got clients in over 70 countries all over the world. Um, and the, the whole thing's been bootstrapped. I haven't taken out any kind of outside funding or venture capital or anything like that. So it's definitely been a, a wild ride through the ascension points of just being myself to, to now having you know, a big team. And we're doing about $20 million a year in, in revenue. And we've got, as I said, hundreds of clients and we've helped them to generate $1.33 billion in sales in over 416 different industries. So a lot of agencies will niche down into like one industry or e-commerce or you know, life insurance or whatever it might be. Um, but we're, we're pretty much in every single niche. So we, we solve a very like complex problem and our business is all centered around solving the number one problem that businesses face, which is how do we get more customers? Um, and that's the thing that, you know, I'm just obsessively focused on in helping us solve that problem for our clients, um, is coming up with predictable proven ways for them to consistently bring clients in the door. So that's really what the beating heart of our company is. And over, you know, really the last six years, we've, we've certainly like made a lot of changes specifically in the last year where we're, we're not just a standalone digital marketing agency anymore, where we have also built like an online program that helps businesses to really get all of the, the technology, the psychology and everything in between that they need to, to grow their business to, to kind of seven figures. So I have a book out, we have courses and we have our agency that offers done for you work for our clients. And we're really building a platform out that enables businesses to grow. Thank you, Sapri. I, I, I want to catch on the book. This is one of the favorite books I have ever read. I have read it like a million times. It's full of markings. And um, some of the present students have been exposed to things I have learned here. It's, it's a really a remarkable book. Uh, you said you started alone and, and made 150 telesales calls. That's like, um, that's already something that uh, not many of us, us can do, but uh, how did you evolve from that um, to, to a big agency? So, uh, so obviously something happened and, and, and uh, you changed your approach. So, so what, what, what did happen? Yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's a great question, right? And <clears throat> the reason that I started, I guess, you know, making 150 cold calls is because I didn't have any other choice. Like I had no money in the bank account. 
um, I didn't have any money to spend on advertising. So I had to use sweat equity to start the business from making phone calls. And, you know, I, I kind of was making 150 cold calls a day. It took me about three days um, to get my first client. And then I, I, I kept doing that for, for probably about five months where I was cold calling every day like that until I had a whole bunch of clients and until I had saved enough money up um, to, to really start to invest in marketing. And, you know, I, I'd always like, I, I, King Kong's not my first business, right? I, I, I've had other businesses and I've, you know, run some of them really well. I've run some of them into the ground. I've sold some of them. Um, and I've always been tasked in all of those businesses with solving the problem of how do we get new customers? So it's something that I've obviously been focused on for a long part of my life. Um, and as soon as I did get enough money, you know, I started doing what a lot of people do, which is like start researching from the blogs and doing courses and doing a lot of stuff. And a lot of the things that I tried, like they just didn't work. And like when, when you're like cold calling for every dollar, like every dollar is worth so much. And when, when you lose that money, it really, really stings. So realistically what happened to me is I was being really successful selling over the telephone and bringing on clients. Um, and then I was trialing marketing, marketing um, you know, strategies and a lot of the stuff that I was trying wasn't working. And it was at that stage where I started to put everything that I was learning from other people to bed. And I just rested on what I was doing on the telephone and what I was saying to, to complete strangers to build enough desire and confidence that they would happily like hand over their credit card number or the telephone and then sign up with me. Um, as an agency and then work with me long term. And I just took that message that I was delivering one to one on the telephone. And I started to put that message into ads. And that was when I really made the transition of making 150 cold calls a day to then writing ads that I was putting on Facebook and a whole bunch of places that would call on 150,000 people per day. And it was that moment that was really a big turning point. And that was where I was really be able, where I was able to create much more demand for my services than there was supply. And that, you know, going through that process is also what gave me the confidence to hire somebody and to have to pay for their salary and to, to build a business and to, to get an office and to start to really build out something that was a lot bigger than myself is simply having that ability to turn advertising into profit. Okay, this is very interesting. It's very interesting in very many ways. One, one of the things that I'm now like 56 and, and one of the things that I, I learned only from your book is actually the connection between sales and marketing and, 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 uh, and how, to, how to start bringing in quality leads whom you can then call and, 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 and talk to instead of, of cold, cold calling. Uh, before we go to the marketing, one more question. Uh, can you tell a little bit where your work ethic comes from about your childhood, about making the peanut butter and, and the harmonica thing and, and helping your mom out? Sure, yeah. Um, so I was raised by a single parent mother um, in a small beach town in Australia called Byron Bay. And I, you know, from a very early age, watched my mother, you know, work three jobs to provide a really good quality of life for, for me and my sister. Um, and I used to get up before school every morning and she was working in a cafe early on in the mornings. Um, and then she would go and do another two jobs throughout the day. And I would wake up and I would help her go and set up that cafe in the morning. Um, and really at the age of, you know, I think I was eight or so at the time when I got my first job in a health food store, grinding peanut butter up manually and selling that. Um, and now I was earning $2.50 an hour for that. <laughs> And I did that for, for, for a while. And then I, I realized like, look at $2.50 an hour, I'm never really going to be earning the kind of money that's gonna make an impact and actually help my mother out and make her life easier. So that was when I, like my mother actually bought me a harmonica and I decided that on the Sunday markets that I was gonna go busk at that. And I didn't know how to play the harmonica. I didn't know anything, um, but that didn't stop me from going there, putting a hat down and just starting to play that thing. And in my first day I earned $80. Um, and then I ran and I gave that to my mother. So that was really my first entrepreneurial journey. Um, but realistically what I learned from those formative early years in my life from watching my mother is that like, you know, 
work ethic is is the number one thing that's going to determine whether or not you're going to make it at night. It's, it's the only thing that you can control. You, there's so many factors outside of your control, like, you know, how big your competitors are, if they've got venture capital, you know, if they play dirty, if they do all of these things. But the one thing that you can control is just how hard you work. And it's been something that served me very, very well um, for, for my entire life. You know, before I started my company, I was always the top salesperson at every company that I ever worked for. Being simply willing just to outwork everybody. Like I, I would not care how good or how talented anyone would be. I would just show up and I would outwork these people. And I know that people wouldn't be willing to do those things that I was willing to do. Um, and that's been something that I still use today in, in my company. Like I'm the first one in here. I grind really hard. You know, I wake up at 4am in the morning. Um, and I think that work ethic is just, it's like a muscle and it's incredibly important that people know the value of that thing. And it's for free. You can forge it yourself without anybody's permission. And if you do, and if you, if you're constantly working on it, that thing will make sure that you are a okay in your life. I think that's really amazing and, and I really like the metaphor. It's like a muscle. Uh, it, it's sort of a reassuring that even if you don't feel that you have it now, you can train it and, and, and then start like becoming better. Better at it. Uh, getting back to marketing, you have this wonderful uh, metaphor also. You say that baker is not in the business of baking bread. What do you mean with that? Yeah, so if you look at most businesses, right, most businesses are started from somebody having a passion or experiencing like a problem about something and then them solving that problem for themselves um, and then continuing to do that, right? So the baker is like, typically they love cooking or then they love baking breads and stuff. And then they're like, I really enjoy this. And then either someone told them or they thought themselves, hey, I could probably make a business out of this. And then they start a business, they don't really have any, like any training around marketing or selling or anything like that. And they, they think that the success of their business is going to be purely based on the quality of bread that they can bake, right? And they focus all their time and energy, kneading the dough, baking the bread, getting the best ingredients. And, you know, realistically, there are a lot of people in the world that exist that are very, very good at what they do. And their craftsmanship is, is second to none, yet nobody knows about them and they don't make any money and they aren't able to help so many people because they think that they're in the business of baking bread, but they're in the business of selling bread. And it's, it's a very important distinction to make that you know, the money isn't in the goods, it's in the selling of those goods. And that doesn't mean that you don't need to have a world-class product and it doesn't need to be really good. But what it means is even if you did have a world-class product and you didn't know what business you were in, which is in the business of selling, then it doesn't matter how good the product is. So realistically, you know, you, you can see it. And I see it all the time in, in my business from a lot of people that we work with. You'll see a, like a baker or a restauranteur or a catering guy who starts up a business because he loves to cook. And then he tries to, he tries to build that business and it's, it's a really hard grind for him. He doesn't know how to get customers. And you come back 10 years time and all that person has done is created a job for themselves. And they're, they're working tirelessly 15 hours a day for little money, little of money that they probably would have working for somebody else. And then there's another type of person and you come back 10 years later and they've got like a national catering businesses with locations in every city in the country. And they're doing, you know, tens of millions of dollars in revenue. And you really look at, well, what's the difference? What's the difference in those two types of people? And really the difference really comes down to the founder is ability to be able to sell and market and to bring clients in the door predictably. That is the thing that makes the difference. And, you know, most businesses think that they're in the wrong business. They think that they're in the business of building houses or fixing teeth or baking bread. They're in the business of selling those services. That's, that's where the majority of their time needs to be focused on because that's the determining factor of what makes a business successful. So in essence, a baker is not in the business of baking bread, but he's in the business of selling bread. Um, a baker might say to himself that, uh, okay, I understand this, but I'm not 
good at copywriting or creating content, what would you say to a person like this? I would say that you better, you better get good at that stuff because at the end of the day, if you know how to sell, then you can hire all the people to do everything else. And the rarest skill on earth is having the ability to sell and market and to turn advertising in, into profit. So you're going to have a very hard time if you just say, I'm not good at these things and you throw it in the too hard basket. Typically, if you look at most businesses, it is, it is like a co-founder in the business. One would be a salesperson and then the other person would be the product guy, right? You look at like Apple with Steve Jobs and Wozniak, like, you know, Steve Jobs was a salesperson. And typically in most businesses, that's always the case. There's someone that's a showman and it's a salesman. And then you've got somebody that's like the engineer or the product person. So if, if you're in a business and you, know, you, you have a co-founder, you need to get very clear on who is the salesperson and who's going to bring the customers in and then who's going to be the delivery person. And if you don't have a co-founder, then selling isn't something that you can outsource. It's not something that you can just hire somebody to come in and do. You need to be the best salesman in your company because you're going to be selling every day. You're going to be selling your prospects of why they should go with you over a competitor, why they should pay premium rates. You're going to be selling your employees of why they should come and work for you and not go and take another job. Um, and there's this, you're going to be selling your vision of where your company is trying to go to, what is it that you're trying to do. And it's just something that if you're not a book, like, you know, I don't believe that there are born salespeople. Like I believe that they're trained. When I got my start in sales, I was no good. I was the worst salesperson at the entire company. Um, but I, 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 I got very clear and focused of what I, I was going to do. Um, and that I was going to master this thing. And then I became the best salesperson at that company. So it's like anything. It's like a muscle that you can train. It's a skill that you can learn and you need to dedicate to it because it's the most important skill in life. Um, there are many very important points. Can you, can you briefly tell how did, you trans, how did the transition go from worst salesman to the best salesman? What, what like happened? Yeah, sure. So my first job in sales, it was in Byron Bay. Um, and I was 16 years old and I was working for a company that was selling ink cartridges. So we would call businesses up and we would buy their empty ink cartridges off them. Then we would fill those ink cartridges up and we would sell those ink cartridges back to those businesses. And it was a group interview of like 15 people. And they gave us the script to read and we were all sitting around in a circle and they made us all read, all read the script. And then, you know, the founder of that business gave us some feedback of how we read the script and some changes to make. And then he went around and we did that, you know, three times. And then he, he told 20 of the, or he t told 10 of the 15 people to leave. Um, and he said, look, I can teach you how to sell, but if you don't listen to what I tell you, then I'm not going to be able to teach you. And I was fortunate to be in like the, the three people that did get, get the job. Um, and I found it very difficult. It was like a cold, hard slap to the face for me. It was my, I was my first real foray into the front lines of capitalism, asking strangers for money. Um, and it was very, very difficult. And I remember it was like a two week trial. And at, and at the end of the two weeks, I was like doing way worse than the other two people that were hired. But the founder, he, he saw something in me in his own words. And he's like, look, I'm going to give you another week because I see something in you, but you need to turn this thing around. Like you need to listen to what I'm telling you and you need to basically make a change. Um, and so I remember going home that night and it was like, I guess a little bit of a moment of like, you know, desperation where it's like, I've got to make this work. I've got to figure it out. And what I've been doing has been the wrong approach. Um, and it was like a flick switched in me overnight. And the next day when I came to the office, I just thought, look, I'm going to look at this as a game. I'm going to gamify this. And all I'm going to do is when I call these people up, I'm just going to talk to them about their problems and like what I can do for them. I'm not going to talk about the company that I'm calling from and how great we are. And these are all of our products and services. I'm just going to go straight for what that person wants. Um, and then that was what I did. I did that. I figured out that it was, that it worked. And then I made twice as many phone calls as anyone else in the company. Huge. That's huge. Uh, you, you cover a couple of very important points. One, you said that 
good selling and marketing is are, are one of the rarest skills in the world. And the other one was that uh, you you shouldn't outsource selling. I think those are the very important points. Um, in your book, you have this uh, um, strategy that you say that one should aim to become the trusted authority in his space. So what do you mean with this? And can you explain a little bit with sure. how, how to do that? So basically what your ultimate goal is, right? If you look at kind of what is the biggest hurdle for being able to turn a, a complete stranger into a paying customer, it's the number one reason is that people simply don't trust you, right? There's a lot of people out there that talk a lot of, lot of game. They talk about a lot of things, but they don't deliver. So that's the biggest barrier that you must cross as a person is being to get people to trust you. And like the way that you get them to trust you is to become the authority in your marketplace. So, you know, I'm a firm believer that every single business you know, is they're going to have to provide value-based marketing. So their marketing can't just be a sales message. It can't just be like, you should come and buy from us because we're really great. And here are all of our products and services. And we've been in the business for a hundred years. So that's why you should come and buy from us, right? That was the way that, you know, businesses was done in the dark ages. Like a merchant would be out in the market. He would lay out all of his wares on a carpet and, you know, a customer would come up to him, they would heckle on price, and then a deal would be done. And that's how most people are still operating their business, where right now, people have the internet, they have so much questions before they buy, they have so much information that's available to them. And whoever controls the information flow in the buying decision, like life cycle, they're the ones that wins, because you're you're controlling like the whole paradigm that that buyer is in. So really the, like that's it in an esoteric way. And here's now exactly what you need to do in order to become the authority. So realistically, what you want to do is you want to treat your prospects as if they are already paying clients before any money changes hands. And you want to start deliver, delivering value to your market by educating them, right? of how to get to the place that they want to go, the desired outcome. What is this problem that they're trying to solve? Whether it's they're trying to lose weight, they're trying to get more energy, or they're trying to grow their business, whatever it might be. You want to pretend like that they're already a paying client and you want to start delivering value to them. Because when you do that, you're proving that you can help them by actually helping them. While everyone else in the marketplace is trying just to sell these people, you're delivering value to them. And then you are becoming the trusted advisor and the authority in that marketplace. And then you command premium prices. People want to do business with you because you've already delivered value to them before they've even done business to you. So they know that you can help them. It's not a risk. And therefore you've crossed the biggest hurdle that exists with, which is getting people to trust you. If you can get people results before they pay you, they trust you. And as that trust level goes up, their amount of certainty to do business with you also goes up. And then it just allows you to completely dominate your marketplace. Yeah, this, I totally buy this. Uh, if you take, again, a, as an example, the baker who, who, who is uh, in the business of selling bread, how could he try to become the trusted authority of, of his, his field? Yeah, look, it's a little bit different with more with more transactional items like um, bread. But for instance, let's just say that you've got, you know, two bakers and one person is advertising like their breads in the local newspaper. Typically, what they're going to be doing is they'll be like, here are the baguettes, here are the bread rolls, here are the bread, and this is how much they are, right? And that's how typically most people market. But what, you know, an authority-based, value-based marketer, what they would do is they would tell the full story about how they source the wheat, right? And then how they make the dough and they ferment it. And through that fermenting process, it breaks down proteins in the gluten in the wheat that actually makes it a lot more digestible for your gut. And it allows you to absorb a lot of nutrients from that. And that's what makes the finest bread in the world. And we only source the best, you know, organically grown wheat that comes from this province in Europe that produces wheat plants that are thousands of years old. 
and really starts to educate them and get them to buy into the story and the education of why this bread is the best bread. And if you wrote an ad like that, that was, you know, positioned as a news article or something of standalone interest about how the, the, the bread is processed, whether or not someone is going to buy that bread, they would still be much more inclined to read that ad that is more educational in nature than someone that's just like, you can get six bread rolls for two euros. Um, do you know what I mean? So it's just in the positioning of how you do that. They would both be paying the same amount of money for the same real estate in that, for that advertisement. But it's been shown that people are five times more likely to read an educational message than they are to read an ad. So that's just a basic, you know, premise of something that you could do, but his like predominantly with, you know, authority based marketing, it's more so for service based businesses that really have clients that they're enrolling into their program where there's more information involved in order for them to become a client, right? You're not going to do a lot of research into what bread rolls are available at the bakery. But if you are hiring a financial planner or a digital marketing agency or a plastic surgeon, it's not going to be an impulse purchase. You're going to be doing lots of research around that. And that's really where authority-based marketing comes into play. Very good. You, you mentioned in the book that you use a tool called Answer to Public, Answer to Public in, in order to create these uh, educational uh, materials. Can you tell a little bit about that, how that works out? Sure, yeah. So Answer the Public is a website that aggregates all of the questions that people are asking across Google and across Bing. And it just gives you the direct keyboard like access of what people are typing in. What are the hair on fire problems and questions that are keeping them up at night tossing and turning, unable to sleep until they have the answers to these questions. And it really allows you to kind of camp out in the, inside the mind of your dream type of client and find out everything that's going on in that person's mind. And then what we do is we use that information to craft what I call a high value content offer, which is simply a piece of information like a free report or a PDF or an ebook that promises the answers to those hair on fire questions that our market has in exchange for their name and email address. And that allows us to really get them to identify themselves and raise their hand in a sea of prospects as being interested in what it is that we have to sell. And it's just taking a very data, like data and like data scientist approach to the whole thing, not just wondering what your prospects want, wondering what their questions are, but actually looking at the hard facts of exactly what it is that they want. Okay, very good. We will we'll take a student question now. The question is that how do you brand your knowledge and skills? How do I brand it? Yeah. Um, I'm not super clear on the question, but I'll try to answer it to my best ability. Um, in terms of how we brand it, like I've got a book out where I've got all of my content on there as well. Um, if, you know, on, on our website, kingkong.com.au, we have a whole bunch of different free reports that we, that we give away as, as bait. And we'll brand that up depending on what that free report is about. It might be the five things that you absolutely must know before building a website or before speaking to a web designer. Um, and we obviously brand that up with our company logo um, and whatnot. Um, and then I've obviously got my book that I push out that's really under my personal brand. Um, and that's really like the way that we go about it. Okay, very good. Um, there was another question. Um, how do you explain your value to your customers so that they can sort of choose you instead of other, other vendors? That's a great question. So realistically, you know, it, it starts in being able to articulate your prospects problem better than that they can themselves, right? Most people in most companies and most salespeople they're simply trying to pitch their product and service to people, whether or not it's going to be a good fit. And I'm very, very against that. That's not the way that you build a big business, right? Um, so 
realistically, the first step is doing what I call the diagnosis and diagnosing what the problem is that your prospect is experiencing and then being able to truly seize whether or not you can help them. Not everyone's going to be a great fit for what you do, right? So the first thing is to do a diagnosis and to be able to articulate their problem better than they can themselves. Um, and then really position your product as being the solution to that problem. Now, I know that sounds very simple in theory, but what most people do is they jump straight to the selling part. And it's a very thinly veiled agenda of, okay, I'm speaking to a salesperson, they're trying to make a commission and sell me at all costs. But if you, if you sit down and you really understand that person's problem and you can tell it to them, you're going to be able to articulate that problem to them better than any one of your competitors. And when you're able to do that, your prospects rightfully assume that you have the solution to their problem because you know exactly what their problem is. So that's really like the premise of it. And then you want to start to think about what is the value of you being able to help them solve that problem. And then that kind of opens up, you know, another path of, you know, people will typically pay, you know, for speed and they're also going to be paying for convenience as well. So someone might be able to get to that solution by themselves. Then if that's the case, then you're going to be selling the speed and the opportunity cost for them to go alone rather than go it with you. Right. And it all really comes down to think about like, what is the value that that person would assign to that problem? And I'm really big on value-based pricing and only charging 10% of the value of how big that problem is, right? So, you know, and, and that's in a whole lot of, there's a lot of different applications for that. You might be a personal trainer and it might be a weight loss goal for some investment banker who really wants to lose weight before his wedding. You might be in a digital marketing agency where, you know, every client is worth $10,000 and they're trying to get, you know, five clients. So that's worth $50,000. Um, and then you're just charging like a 10% of, of that $50,000 as the value creation that you're going to be providing for that client. Okay. That's, that's very good. Um, there's a third question related to, it's, it's, it's for King Kong. How does the company make sure that it's not depending solely on, on your individual skills? Yeah. Terrific, terrific question. Um, so like I have an incredible team. I would not be able to do anything that I do without my team. Like this is not the Sudbury Subi show. I'm not in here in the kitchen, baking the bread, julieting the carrots and doing all of that stuff. I've got a very, very strong team. Um, in my company that are very, very capable that really look after the day-to-day -day of, of the business. I've got a, a rock solid general manager. Um, then I've got seven division managers and then they all run teams. Um, you know, I meet with everyone on my team probably once a fortnight or so. Um, but I've like, I, I need to make it crystal clear that, you know, my success is only being enabled by having very smart, hungry and talented people by my side in the trenches doing this stuff. Um, and I think that I'm in a, in, in a unique position because I have done every role in my company, right? I've been an account manager. I've done Google ads and Facebook ads. I've been a salesperson, a customer service person. I've been the person that has to clean the toilets. I've done everything that there is. So I'm able to speak to people from a place of experience and understanding what they do every day rather than sitting in some ivory tower and never having to get my hands dirty from actually doing the work. So the way that I'm able to really do what I do is by having an incredible team and definitely selling them on my vision of where I think that I can take us as, as, as a company and you know the opportunities that that will enable it to provide them. Um, and making sure that everybody is kind of marching to, to the same drum, so to speak, and everyone understands, you know, why we do what we do and gets gratification in being able to help these businesses bring on more clients, grow their business, the impact that that has on, you know, our clients' lives, 
on their you know network of people on the the churches and charities that they're a part of and it's just such a big ripple effect when you can help someone change their business i'm a firm believer that business is a huge vehicle for change and i think that a lot of the people that that work in our company they get great gratification in being able to actually come to work and do something that matters every day okay it seems that that's really well covered uh, we have about 10 minutes time is it okay for you Sapi? yeah that's fine yeah. so uh, i'll take one more question from the students uh, are influencers a good way to to market a product what do you think about that um, yeah look they are depending on on what kind of business that that you are running right so like i i've spoken to to many of like the the top companies in europe that do you know 400 500 million dollars in euros um all through influencer marketing so it can be a great way to get your product out there um my focus is not so much on influencers i um, mean you have a look at what is typically happening in the influencer space like instagram is, is trying to kind of shut down a lot of that by not showing likes on posts and and, and whatnot and there are av other avenues around it um, but my focus is really about something that will always exist and what will always exist is businesses building communities like facebook like instagram WhatsApp, TikTok, all of these platforms. And then they will build that user voice base to a time where it's got value in being able to monetize that audience by providing advertising to them. And I focus my time and energy on really becoming a master in turning paid advertising into profit because I believe that's the single greatest skill that you can ever acquire. You know, an influencer might not want to post your product. You're at their mercy. You might send them the product. They may not post it. I'm not discounting its effectiveness. It is an effective way. Um, but realistically, you know, what I like to focus on is the things that aren't going to change. And something that's never going to change is that there will be advertising in the world. There will always be somebody building a community of people that then they're looking to monetize and then they will be able to provide businesses with a platform to run ads to those people. Um, and it's just something that's, that's, you've got so much control about it. There's so much scalability to it. Um, and that's the reason why I have really kind of zeroed in on that. I think this, this, is, this is really a little bit surprising point of view from a digital marketing agency, but you said that you make paid advertising into profit. And in, in the book, you also mentioned that uh, often businesses don't actually have a problem with their website traffic, but instead they have a problem with conversion. Can you tell about that? What, what do you mean with that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, the first thing that, you know, when people come into to our business and prospects and customers and stuff like that, they're like, I just need to get more website traffic. That's what I need. I just need to get more eyeballs on my website and then it will be fine. Right. And the reality is that that argument is ridiculous because, you know, Google is, is there. You've got Facebook that has, you know, north of two billion users. There's a ridiculous amount of searches done every day. And you can go to these platforms. And if you have a credit card, you can literally set up an ad account and have ads running within an hour. So, and you can get so much website traffic, you know, you can get 500,000 website visitors in a day. So, and you can do it, all you need is a credit card and you can get that. No problems at all. And if that's the case, then why are so many businesses looking for, for traffic? And why do they think that's the problem? Well, the thing is that the traffic is abundant. It's just like you go to the supermarket to buy groceries. You can go to the traffic supermarket, that's Google and Facebook, and you can get unlimited traffic almost. So really the thing that comes down to is when you, you explain it like this to a prospect, they're like, yeah, but when I, when, I, when I do that, I just don't make any money. Aha, okay, so the problem isn't getting the traffic. It's being able to get the traffic and then convert it at a high enough rate where the unit economics stack up and you make more money for, than the cost of advertising and of delivering that goods and service. And that's really where the, then the attention needs to go then, not in so much as in just getting the traffic, it's having the ability to turn that traffic into customers. And then you, you enter down the whole rabbit hole of 
you know, human psychology and the art of persuasion and salesmanship at mass scale. And that's the thing, as I said, that I choose to focus on the things that don't change. The technology will change. There'll be some new platform in the next five to 10 years that take over the existing ones. But the thing that's not going to change is like the way that the human brain is wired and how it's, how it thinks and, and, and the elements of persuasion. These are the things that, you know, haven't changed in a thousand years. Very good. Uh, when you say convert, by the way, do you mean uh, that people actually buy something or that they leave their contact information and how does that relate to the larger market formula that you speak in, in, the, in the book? Yeah, sure. So like, first of all, like the, 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 the ability to turn that traffic into an actual sale and get somebody's credit card details, that's like a master level skill, right? That you, that you need to be able to do that. And then the step down from that is also being, have, ha having the ability to, to generate a lead. A lot of our clients are in the, in, in the business of the client business, right? Getting clients, servicing those clients. Um, and therefore, in order to get those clients, what needs to take place is that they need to generate a lead and then they need to get on the telephone and they need to be able to convert that lead into an actual customer. So really when we talk about like the conversion standpoint, there's really two different environments. One is we need to convert the traffic at a rate that's profitable to get a lead i.e. it might be that you need to get 10 leads in order to convert one of those leads into a customer. So you need to be really skillful in how effective your message is in actually generating those leads. Um, and then you need to have a good sales pitch for when you get on the telephone with those leads and be able to convert them into customers. And then there's the e-commerce environment where the, the sale takes place on the website itself. Um, and that's where, you know, you, you need to be even more skillful in, in, in the way that you operate to be able to convert that, that traffic into profit. Okay, very good. Uh, related to this, you have this concept called high value content offering. Can you, can you explain that? How does that yeah. work? So basically a high value content offer is something of value. Like it says, it's high value content offer. It's where you're making an offer for a piece of high value content. And, you know, realistically, the reason that we, we use these offers is because again, it's value-based marketing. It helps you be, be the trusted authority in your marketplace. But not only that, it typically converts 500% greater than the typical come and buy our stuff kind of offer. Get in touch for a quote, speak with our team, make an inquiry. Um, you know, when you use a high value content offer, you typically are getting five times the amount of leads, i.e. your cost per lead is five times less than it would be than if you were doing the normal lame sales and marketing stuff of we're so great, come and do business with us. And a high value content offer, the quickest and easiest way to build one of those is a free report. It's just a basic five page free report ebook around the problem that the prospect is trying to solve. Um, but that's not all there is. You can do checklists, you can do video series, webinars. There's a whole bunch of other different offers, but typically the easiest, quickest and down and dirtiest way to do it is with just a basic ebook um, and you offer that in exchange for your prospect's contact details and away you go. Okay, very good. At this point, are there any questions in, in this classroom or the other classroom? We there were a couple of questions online which were to do with um, timing. How much time should be spent on getting the message through and if uh, a prospect is not... Uh, not getting something and another question on how long does it take to build online trust? So just getting an idea of of how long, you know, somebody should should keep trying to, to get a deal. Well, it comes down to like the basic ingredient for a successful business is being able to create much more demand than there is supply. Okay. And it's all going to depend how long you speak with each prospect based on the results of that. Like how much demand is there? How many leads do you have coming into your business? If you're getting 50 new leads and inquiries every single day, then you're going to be, have to be short and brief with those people. You're not going to spend, you know, 30, 40 minutes on the telephone with somebody that doesn't really get it because you're in the fortunate position 
of being spoiled for choice and having so many people to speak to, right? And if you're on the other side of that and you're only getting one inquiry per day, then you're going to spend as long as you need to, to try and convince that person, right? So what we've found is that like the recipes for building a successful business is just to stack the deck in your favor and just to get so much demand for what it is that you do that you're really in a position where, you know, you, you can be like, you do have a, a long line of people that want to do business with you. So you don't need to spend an hour on the telephone with somebody that's just trying to negotiate with you and heckle you on price and get the cheapest offer. Um, and, and, and once you can do that, and once you can engineer a situation where there is a huge, huge demand for what it is that you've got, that's when you're really in the, you're in the driver's seat of your future and where it is that you want to go. Very good. We have one question from our student. I sell home renovations. What is something that I can boost with uh, the, the sales? Yeah, sure. So like what I would be doing straight up is using a high value content offer. I would be creating, you know, a free report about, you know, the 13 things that you absolutely must know before renovating your home. Um, and then I would create another free report to test which one does better um, around like, you know, how to increase the value of your property by 40, 45% in six months or less. Um, and that would be through a home renovation. And then I'd just be talking, I'd be giving a lot of value about how to increase the value of somebody's home, how to make it more livable, what are the things that you need to do. And I would pretend like that they had paid me uh, $250 for that information. And I would deliver the real information to them. Um, and I would show them about like, you know, all, all the ways that you've done all these tips for other business, um, for other people in renovating their home, whether that's to just make their house more livable so they're more comfortable and their family's more comfortable or whether it's to renovate it and then flip it and make a profit. I'd be talking to both. I would find out first of all, what it, what it is, right? What is the bullseye of the market? Like what is that one thing that everybody is trying to, to, to get to in that marketplace? Are they wanting to do it to make a profit and sell the home? Or are they wanting to make it more livable? And then you might say that it's both. There will always be one bullseye in the market. There will always be one center of the market, what we call the white hot center, where the buyers are the most motivated. They're the most, you know, they whip out their wallet and buy irrationally, emotionally, um, and in great volume, because that's the, the absolute bullseye. Like if someone's looking to sell their home in six months and they can hire you for a renovation and they can make 45% more on the value of their home, that's a very, very motivated buyer. Probably more motivated than somebody that's trying to look, make their house just a little bit more comfortable. We have time for one more question. It's coming from the classroom, please. Yeah, sure. Yes. In terms of online sales, do you think that uh, conversion is a good way to look at the uh, efficiency of your marketing. Did you hear that? I did not know. Okay, can you come here and, and uh, tell it to you? Am I just there? Yep. Oh. Um, in, in terms of online sales, do you think that conversion is a good way to look at the efficiency of your marketing? Yes, without a doubt. Like a lot of businesses will, will look at the vanity metrics, right? They'll look at how many impressions that the ad got or how many likes or how many comments on a Facebook post. But the last time I checked, I couldn't take any of those things to the bank and pay my employees. Like I couldn't say, hey, look at all these likes that I've got. Can I please have some money for these? Or look how many impressions that my ads got, right? At the end of the day, the ultimate North Star metric for how effective things are is what the ROI is, right? What is the return on investment? How many money soldiers do I send out and how many do they bring back? And that's the way that you wanna look at it. And even conversion can be some element of a vanity metric because you might be getting lots of leads for something like from one campaign that you're running, but you might not be able to convert any of those leads into customers. Therefore, that, that conversion doesn't really mean much, right? So the ultimate way that you want to look at it is what is that end point? What is that last point of conversion? Whether it's whether you're generating a lead, then the last conversion point is obviously to get that person to sign up as a client or to pay you money or to buy your product or service over you. And then that's the full conversion path. 
If it's e-commerce, you're looking at the conversion of somebody coming through to the website and actually buying. Yeah, this was a great question and great answer. I, I really like the term vanity metrics. So it means basically that uh, <clears throat> something is happening, but it's not, not creating any, any results. And, and uh, the importance of ROI that you, you need to understand how much the investment is returning. Um, Penny, do you have questions there? Seems no. Okay, Sabri, it's has been really interesting and, and rewarding to, to have you here. Uh, I thank you very much. Uh, as a final question, if somebody wants to reach your agency, what would be the best way to, to, to reach out for you and ask for your services? Yeah, like uh, you can go to kingkong.com.au. Um, that's, that's a place that you can start. But the reality of it is that there's going to be a huge amount of people um, that won't be able to afford to hire our agency. And a really good starting point is, you know, just to, to really check out my book. And you can get that um, at selllikecrazybook.com forward slash free. Um, and we'll send it out to anywhere in the world. Um, we'll send the book for free. All we ask is that you help us out with the shipping and handling cost and whether or not, you know, you ever become a client of King Kong or whatnot. Um, you know, I think that book will serve you and it will help you become a better marketer. It will help you bring customers on board. Um, and you know, that, that might be a better starting point. Thank you, Sabri, very much for your uh, presentation. No problems. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I'll get back.